Cut to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide buddy, he's your peptide buddy. By popular request, today let's talk about the risks of ipamorelin, one of the first GHRPs that agonizes the ghrelin growth hormone secretagog receptor. Ipamorelin is incredibly popular, oftentimes utilized by those who seek improved sleep, performance enhancement, or a myriad of other purported benefits that those have sought with experimental peptide use. And before we get started, I wanted to let you all know that I'm beyond flattered that Dr. Chris Rayner, an awesome doctor YouTuber whose content and production value is out of this world gave me a shout out on his recent discussion on peptides. It's beyond flattering that this small peptide YouTuber who a year ago was talking to pretty much just myself and a couple of others drew his attention and I can't underscore my appreciation to you all. Here's the clip. As a YouTuber whose entire channel is dedicated to peptides, Peptide Buddy points out Many cancers cannot spread if it's not supplied by collateral blood flow. Targeting VEGF is being evaluated in managing certain types of cancers. And if you haven't already, and you like cut and dry assessments of peptide research without the blanket statements and buttered up data, give us a like and subscribe. It's the best way to help a small peptide YouTuber out. Now let's get started. Ipamorelin. It's a pentapeptide, i.e. consists of five amino acids that agonizes the ghrelin growth hormone secretagog receptor. We've done multiple videos going into its development and attempted clinical use, so I won't cover all that's been covered before, but like many other peptides, ipamorelin acetate has found its way onto the FDA's proposed ban of compounding released September of 2023 for reasons of concern with regards to proposed risks and benefits, one of which being death of study participants, which I think is an adequate basis of our discussion and what we're really going to dive into here. So ipamorelin was evaluated in the context of gastrointestinal function in assessing its role in alleviating post-operative ileus, or gastric dysmotility after surgery, after development by Novo Nordisk, i.e. Big Pharma, and sponsored by Helsin Therapeutics, which is a Swiss company tied to US research and development, and it was evaluated in humans after rodent studies hosted by Helsin exhibited accelerated gastric emptying, and this clinical trial was completed in 2014, and it appears that they were initially considering 320 participants, but ultimately 114 were enrolled, and of note, one of the confounding factors to the collected data besides low number of participants is the fact that many people had significant underlying medical conditions. Let's start with the fact that 49 of the participants treated with ipamorelin had treatment-related adverse effects, which places that at 87.5% of the people in the group who received the peptide. Is that a bit concerning? Certainly, but there's a caveat, of course. Most commonly reported effects were nausea, vomiting, and abdominal distension, and since those enrolled in the trial had just literally just received intra-abdominal surgery, that's not necessarily surprising. If ipamorelin were to promote gastric motility and contractility at a subset of people at risk for gastrointestinal adverse effects, these people who had just been under anesthesia and operated on and received opioid medications that would slow gastric emptying, GI symptoms including distension are in my opinion unsurprising. Hypokalemia or low potassium and insomnia were also present in greater than 5% of the study participants and this is also obscured by the fact that post-surgical pain, being in a hospital, decreased oral intake all can understandably influence sleep quality and regulation as well as some transient electrolyte abnormalities. Glucose dysregulation also appeared to be present, as a greater number of people receiving ipamorelin had more significant alterations in blood glucose at discharge than did those involved with placebo. And I suspect this is due to post-surgical inflammation and reactive metabolism changes, likely compounded by the fact that growth hormone and IGF-1 augmentation can indeed decrease insulin sensitivity, and we've talked about that in more detail before. Now let's talk about the more acutely serious adverse effects. Post-operative infection was present equally between both groups essentially, and anastomatic leak was 2 to 1 in ipamorelin compared to placebo. However, given the limited sample size and acute surgical setting, I cannot ascertain if this is significant, however it's worth discussing. And now the kicker is that two patients unfortunately succumbed to fatal adverse effects after the procedure. One was with hyperkalemia or high potassium in a patient with aortic clots, sepsis, perforated ulcer, and renal failure failure, and sepsis in a patient with pneumonia. And although researchers considered this was possibly due to ipamorelin, these deaths were after patients had completed
targeted therapy, and it's tough to make sense of because these effects, which are modulated by immune dysregulation, were present in people who were already in poor health. And mechanistically, at least, it's hard to paint the picture in such a small study that ipamorelin would have predisposed them to this unless there were impurities in the ipamorelin itself or enhanced gastric motility literally provoked ulcer perforation, which is hard to ascertain when someone just received intra-abdominal surgery and has baseline poor health related to gastrointestinal function. And although the first meal was tolerated more rapidly in the ipamorelin group, the presence of adverse effects and limited sample size, predominantly so, is the reason why results are insignificant and Big Pharma hopped off the ipamorelin train, right? Novo Nordisk ran with semaglutide. If they were to do the same with ipamorelin, I'm sure there would be a lot more money, research, popularization, clinical utility considerations, but that's not the case. So when assessing ipamorelin risks, it's important to consider their data. However, it's not the end-all be-all at this point given the limitations. In an otherwise healthy person, site-specific reactions are always possible, whether it's itchiness, pain, or urticarial reactions, or more systemic adverse effects, whether they be headache, nausea, flushing, and of course there are things that we always want to be wary of when we're considering augmenting growth hormone, like increased chance of getting insulin resistant, or predispositions to certain types of cancers, and we can't say with certainty that death is imminent, of course. However, it's most likely the reason why researchers stop messing around with ipamorelin, understandably so. And from a practical standpoint, this is compounded by the fact that under its current status, ipamorelin is purely experimental, which means that these peptides pharmacies that are not actually pharmacies suffer no consequences besides poor word of mouth if they were to fudge their labs or add inactive ingredients to their products, which could predispose people to infection, sepsis, immune dysregulation based on impurity. And although a 1999 study tested pharmacokinetics of ipamorelin in only eight people, there was no assessment of its safety profile. So there's very very little for us to go by, but I did my best to read the research so you don't have to. Point being, there is so much to consider when starting peptide therapy, especially these more experimental ones that we're essentially scouring the internet to find pharmacies that aren't actually pharmacies, and for the most part, it is quite likely that we're consuming God knows what. So my goal here isn't to say that all peptides are good or all peptides are bad, but just to really highlight what we know and what we don't. I hope you found this educational, informative, perhaps entertaining, and if not, please recommend my channel for those with insomnia and need something to watch before bed. If you do like this type of content and want to see more like it, check out the Patreon. It's in the description below, and each video has a 30-second sample. And if you haven't already, hit that like and subscribe button, and most importantly, most importantly, have a great day. Take care. Cut to the chase, evidence-based, pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide buddy, he's your peptide buddy. Cut to the chase, evidence-based, pull